One of the raging debates of the 20th century is about the relative merits of science and faith. This debate is most animated when it comes to the question of creation versus evolution. Was man created by God in his own image, as the book of Genesis tells us? Or did man evolve from a cosmic blast, often referred to as the Big Bang? Is it possible that God created man, but used the process of evolution to do so? This is where the tension between science and faith begins. But what about natural phenomena, such as earthquakes, floods, hurricanes? Are these to be viewed as the wrath of God, or as the natural byproducts of an environment that has evolved over millions of years? How old is the Earth? Is there life beyond our world? We know this much. While one must have faith to believe in God, one must also have a strong degree of faith to believe only in science. Are science and faith mutually exclusive? Can the two peacefully coexist? In the next few minutes, we'll examine these questions and consider whether people of faith and scientists can reconcile their differences, perhaps based on the premise that God created this earth and that science provides the method for unraveling many of its mysteries. When I went to college, I went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I went there as a, as a not yet Christian, I was a, a, a Jewish person, and I went there as a chemistry major. I wanted to get a PhD in chemistry and do research chemistry. And that's actually what my undergraduate degree is in, is in chemistry. I had been to a number of special programs in high school, so I, I was basically a scientist. I'd been thought to, to uh, think like a scientist, to see the world like a scientist, to evaluate like a scientist using the scientific method. And so, and when I was confronted with the issue of becoming a Christian, that was a real issue for me. What are we really saying here? Now, I, a couple of thoughts in response to that. One, once I came to the place where I understood who God really was and His immensity, suddenly the idea that God created the world out of nothing was no longer as nearly as much of a problem for me. Because if God is who He says He is, creating the world is easy. So that helps some. But then what about all the dichotomies between what geology says about the age of the earth in the Bible, you know, all that astronomers tell us about the universe, and, and all that, uh, well, evolutionists and biologists and zoologists tell us about the evolution of human life as opposed to being created by God. What, what about all these issues? You know, I've done some real study on that, and, and I can't solve that problem for everybody. You know, I can probably cannot present enough evidence to convince people airtight based on strictly scientific evidence that God made the world out of nothing. By the way, evolutionists can't present enough evidence to convince people that God didn't either. Neither one of us can present an airtight case. And I did a series of messages not long ago for our frontline ministry, which are Generation Xers, young people. And what I tried to show them was not that I could convince them airtight that God made the world the way He said, but that there's a lot more evidence to support that than people realize, than people going through our public education system realize. And I quoted eminent physicist, eminent mathematician, eminent biologist after the other, who are willing to come out and say, not necessarily that God made the world a la Genesis 1 and 2, but that evolution makes no sense. That the way we have put together the evolutionary model of the universe makes no sense. These are not even Christians, but they, they look at the evidence and they say it makes no sense. Mathematically, the probabilities are astronomical that we could come up with what we have today in terms of the complexity of human life and the complexity of our world systems by accident, without design. I think there is a conflict between religion and science. Whether it is real or not, or whether it must exist, is perhaps another issue. The fact that it does exist, I think, is undeniable in many areas, not least of which is centered around the division between those who claim that they are evolutionists and those who claim that they are creationists. And those two words are susceptible of vast amounts of interpretation, and they don't mean one particular thing because they carry two whole different ideas of understanding humanity. I'm not here to try and expound all the various efforts of creationists 
nor yet to defame all those who are evolutionists. But where you seek to be able to understand what God has said about himself in terms of revelation and the limits of revelation are clear. They are not always scientific in description, although they are always true. I'm not suggesting that God has revealed himself in ways that are non-true, but that ultimately you recognize that God is truth and that he reveals himself in truth. If that becomes axiomatic in life, then there is no subject that you can pursue truly that will in any way challenge God. And it ought to be, though I certainly recognize it is not always the case, that Christians ought to be those who are least afraid to look at anything that claims to be true and to approach it recognizing that all truth necessarily is God's truth. And that truth will not conflict with God, nor with his revelation of himself. And so I think there is a rapprochement possible. It comes in the way in which we seek and understanding the nature of truth itself. The conflict between religion and science comes oftentimes because either or both of those systems claim too much and sometimes too little, each for themselves or for others, and inevitably, they come places where resolution of issues is necessary. It's my own contention that there is no necessary challenge offered either by science or religion to the proper engagement of either of those disciplines, that both faith and the search after knowledge should go hand in hand, one sanctifying the other, the other informing in terms of boundary and information. The chances of this creation with the DNA and all we're finding out about science, that's showing us more about God, not discounting God. Any logical person that would look at that scientific, these scientific uh, theories and discoveries that we have would have to be face to face with the fact that there is a God of design, there is a God of purpose, there is a God of love, and we as Christians believe that's found in Jesus Christ, that God cares so much about his creation that he came down, he came down and walked, God in human flesh, walked throughout his creation and said, hey, you're going the wrong way, but I have an answer for you. The answer is turn your life over to God and allow God to redeem us and make us new in Jesus Christ. Some of the greatest scientists of all ages and some of the greatest uh, scientists t today are believers in Christ and don't really feel that there is any opposition or contradiction between issues of faith and issues of science. So that, and it's also important to point out that it's often within the biblical worldview that we have a great encouragement of science. For instance, the view that maintains that creation is real and not illusory uh, and good uh, means that it's real and it can be studied, and it's good and it should be studied, and every truth you find within science will sooner or later, later lead you back to the God of truth. So the whole idea that Augustine maintained is that you ought to learn everything you can about anything you can, realizing that you're just discovering the footprints or the thumbprints, the fingerprints of the creator uh, in the creation. So it was a great encouragement of scientific study that was really present in uh, the biblical worldview, really forwarded science. And when you don't have that kind of worldview, there's often not that kind of encouragement, say, in a more Eastern worldview. This really has, has not really encouraged or fostered the uh, study of science. Uh, I would also say that with, with regard to science and, say, the Bible or science and faith, uh, you always have to look very carefully at both science and the Bible. First of all, science uh, 
often has theories that are pointed out, and as Thomas Kuhn pointed out in his structure of scientific revolutions, uh, often those theories are, are hypotheses that are based upon certain facts, and there can be new ones that come along from time to time. And so it means that each scientific theory, even though it may be the theory of the day, doesn't necessarily mean that it's absolute. It really deserves to be questioned in some ways, and you need to continue to re-examine the evidence and see if there are any anomalies, any things that don't quite fit within that particular framework. That's very important. But if something really is proved in science, uh, you also have to examine your interpretation of scripture. Because I think often believers have shut out certain uh, interpretations of scripture because they have a predetermined idea of what the Bible says rather than looking at it in some uh, other ways. Uh, the important thing is to always look at the author's intention or look at uh, what the passage really says to see whether it is intention with a scientific worldview or maybe I've just misinterpreted the passage or tried to make it say something that it's not saying. Trying to impose my own agenda, my own culture, my own questions on the Bible and try to make it an answer questions that it's not trying to answer at that perspective. The classic illustration of that is Galileo and people that use the biblical language of sunrise, sunset to talk about a geocentric universe. And I think that's misguided to try to interpret uh, the Bible that way. Uh, so if there's a problem, you examine science and you also examine your interpretation of scripture because the problem could be on either side of it. So you need to be rigorously honest with, with both. When you go to the leading archaeologists, you find that they find so many things that agree with the Bible. And um, to date, I think there really hasn't been any major disagreement that I have found when I have studied. And it was interesting. I was just at a wedding where um, a lot of the guests were from Australia, and they were all biologists. A lot of them were marine, but there was one evolution biologist who I got to really speak to. And um, I would mentioned him, you know, did you read... Um, the last chapter of Darwin's Origin of Species, and it talks about his belief in God and how he didn't necessarily believe that his whole theory was true, but that he did believe in a God. And he said he hadn't read that, which I found was really interesting being a specialist in that field, and also that he didn't believe in creation or the Bible. And I asked him, have you ever read it, the Bible? Have you ever looked into that? And he said, no. And so I think a lot of science is based on, I've heard this, or I've been taught this, rather than personally seeking out it yourself. Because I know when I first was really confronted with scripture and the truth of it, I spent um, time reading through from Genesis to Revelations to really find out if this was true or if it was something that my parents taught me or because I grew up in America, um, I was taught. So I really challenge anybody to really look at the evidence before making a decision because I think it impacts your eternity. I don't see myself a great contradiction between these two views. If you understand by the Christian doctrine of creation that the fundamental principle is that everything that is owes its origin to one who understands it all, who willed it all, who in time made it all. What science is interested in is, is the mechanisms through which God acted. We assume that God typically doesn't do things just bam directly. He typically works through other secondary causes, we sometimes say. One thing starts another, and, and it all uh, uh, develops. Um, in the birth of each of us, just for instance, uh, God doesn't make each of us directly, as it were, but through the interplay of a man and a woman. And think how many years there are of flirtation, of courtship, of, of love, of, of nurture, and so on, to, to make a human being. And, and similarly, God does things most creates one thing mostly through the medium of another. Um, and, 
And so science becomes preoccupied with how this all happened. Uh, if creation emerged over time, well, even the Bible story does suggest that, one thing than another. Well, how much time? Well, that really becomes a scientific question if we find ways to measure that. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I don't want to oversimplify a, a very difficult problem in just a few words, but, but do let me make one or two main points. Theologically, from the point of view of faith as I see it, um, and I know this is a sound uh, Roman Catholic view in any case, the crucial point about creation is that whatever there is owes its origin and its being held in being to the Creator, to God. We're fi everything is finally dependent on the Creator. From a scientific point of view, the warning I would give is this, is that when many people talk, many scientists who write in the New Yorker, the New York, New York Review of Books and Scientific American and so forth, um, popular scientists, let me call them, though they may teach at Harvard or Yale or wherever they are, um, sometimes they're doing two things at once. They're not just talking about how one thing emerged from another over eons of time, but they're also committing themselves to a method whose starting place is that everything is purely material. It has nothing infused of spirit in it, and it owes its origin in being to nothingness, to sheer chance, to sheer chaos, and to to imagine anything else is already to import something into reality that isn't there. So they would they don't even argue it, they just make that assumption. And and so what they're asking you to do is to accept a materialistic philosophy and a philosophy of nothingness, of nihilism, of chaos as well. And then they ask you to conduct the argument for well they've prejudiced it in their favor entirely. And uh, I don't I don't think the world presents itself to human beings. Uh, as starkly as that. 